Hey, this is John Carrots here on OSH Radio. I'm here with Janati Strolioroff the second, and uh, he is the chairman of the Transhumanist Party. And we just wanted to do a, a short interview here with him today. We are actually in person. Uh, we were just at a meeting place because I've done a couple of these uh, in person with other people at Transhumanist. And I always joke that it's Transhumanist uh, in cafes getting coffee. But we already did that part. So now we're, we're, we're out here at the capital of, uh, of Nevada. And, and how are you today? I am doing well. Thank you very much, John. It's a beautiful spring day here in Carson City. I'll try and get those towers in the back of the things there with you. There we go. That's a nice view. So, and, and how now lately, the uh, last couple of things we talked about were the upcoming elections and about our candidate, uh, Tom Ross. Uh, what can you tell us about the, the updates on how things are going for Tom? and also how you feel things are going with the other parts of the election and the uh, main parties that are, are characters that are running. Shall we call them characters? <laughs> yes, yes, they certainly are characters. Whether they are benign characters is a question that I will leave to the viewer. Uh, but Tom Ross is doing quite well. We are continuing to push for ballot access for Tom in two states in particular, Louisiana and Tennessee, because the qualifications there for ballot access are fairly reasonable. So in Louisiana, one can pay a $500 fee, and as long as one has eight people who are willing to serve as electors in the event that the candidate is elected as president and receives the majority of votes in Louisiana, then that candidate may be placed on the ballot. So what we are looking for right now are eight people within the state of Louisiana who are willing to serve as electors for Tom Ross. In Tennessee, the situation is perhaps a little bit more challenging in that 275 petition signatures are required, as well as 11 people to serve as electors. But we still think this is an attainable set of objectives for us. But we encourage our members in those states to get involved and to support Tom Ross. And of course, Tom is very active on social media. He has a medium blog on medium.com where he publishes articles regularly. And I would encourage everyone to check out Tom Ross's writings. They are uh, quite insightful and also at times quite provocative because he understands that transhumanism often may be misunderstood. It may often elicit fear-based reactions and he challenges those. He tries to get his viewers to think about transhumanism in a different way and hopefully a more constructive way. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I always used to say when you talk about longevity with people, I used to try and stress it and get it across to them as in extending life and health. And I think sometimes people understand it better when you mention health, uh, although that's not exactly right, but yet it makes it easier for people because people sometimes wonder what you're what you're after and what you're thinking of and they try to you know uh i think science fiction which is kind of true though in a way but they they don't realize the modern day application of what can be helping people and i think sometimes that's why it's good to bring it in terms that maybe sometimes people can understand better without resisting the idea well you know science fiction often inspires the technologies of subsequent eras even the device that you're recording this interview <laughs> on could be said to have been inspired by star trek and the pads that they had in star trek except what you're using is actually a more advanced device now so the science fiction of one era is the reality of the next era and sometimes they blend in together or as has been said the future is already here but it's just unevenly distributed so I think it is important to get people to accurately understand 
transhumanism. There are a lot of conspiracy theories <laughs> about it, for example, that we are trying to overcome. But really, transhumanism is about living longer and living better through the aid of technology and overcoming many of our limitations through the aid of technology. And that's all. It's nothing nefarious. It's nothing designed to control people or give power to an elite. Quite the contrary. This is where a lot of Tom's writing is quite emphatic and quite useful to cultivating a correct understanding that transhumanism is about empowering the individual and sometimes it is the current power elites who want to slow down this kind of progress and who want to create these narratives about transhumanism in order for people to be afraid of it, for people to be mired in what I call the wedge issues or the trench warfare issues of the status quo. And unfortunately, in terms of the mainstream political parties and where this 2024 presidential election is headed, I am not optimistic. When we <laughs> last spoke, I mentioned that I was concerned about a Trump-Biden rematch happening. And my predictions were that if not Biden were to run against Trump, then not Biden would win. If not Trump were to run against Biden, then not Trump would win. But if Trump ran against Biden, then Trump would beat Biden. And it seems that... That's where we're going. Yes. The two major political parties didn't really give the voters a choice. It's not like there were any meaningful primary contests where anybody seriously challenged Trump or Biden without backing down shortly thereafter because the party insiders both on the Democratic side and the Republican side did not really allow any meaningful challenges. So now it's a Trump versus Biden rematch. And my concern is that Trump will win because Trump only has to ask the following question of most Americans. Were your lives better in 2019 as compared to right now? And whether or not that's the fault of Biden or a credit to Trump, it doesn't matter. That rhetoric alone is enough because when Americans vote and when they're stuck in this two-party trap, all that they look at is, are their lives better or worse recently than they were at some prior time period? And if they think their lives are bad right now, they're going to vote for change, whatever change happens to be presented to them. Of course, I think this is all highly choreographed and the two major parties actually benefit from this antagonism, from polarizing the American people, from setting people against one another, from getting 50% of the population to hate the other 50%, and getting people to adopt these packages of ideas that don't necessarily go together or don't have to go together. It's just the way the coalitions for each of the major political parties happen to have formed. But people get invested in them like they get invested in sports teams. And they think, well, unless you believe all of the ideas that Donald Trump is advocating, or unless you believe all of the ideas of the Democratic Party platform, then you are the other, you are evil, you are the 50% of the American population whom we hate. And unfortunately, this is how the political discourse has evolved. It's very simplistic. But the political consultants, the pollsters, the mainstream media really like it that way because they can very conveniently segment people into demographics. And they'll say, well, if you're a 35-year-old Caucasian woman, you will think this way. If you are a 60-year-old male from a state in the Deep South, you will think this way. If you are an African-American in this particular city, you'll think this way. And of course, it's a terrible way to look at people because people are individuals and people can think for themselves and they do think for themselves. And what we try in the transhumanist party is to get people to seriously engage the real issues that are going to affect the future of humanity, how science and technology are shaping our lives, how we really need to use applied rationality to ensure that these technological advances are deployed in a proper way, that they bring out the best in us humans instead of encouraging perhaps some less favorable propensities. And we can certainly see the potential for both with how social media are used, how artificial intelligence 
is used, how other enhancements may be used in the future. So we want to have a serious policy-oriented discussion. In this election, the partisans for both the Republicans and the Democrats, they only want to talk about personalities. They only want to talk about the great evil that the other <laughs> side is going to bring. But we actually want to engage people of a variety of persuasions. That's why we have a big tent. And anybody who is seriously interested in advancing the future of humanity is welcome to join us in the Transhumanist Party. Membership is free, transhumanist-party.org slash membership. And support Tom Ross for president. Help him to gain ballot access. And even if you're in a state where that's difficult, spread his content, spread his videos, and spread also the videos of our virtual enlightenment salons every week every Sunday at 1 p.m. Pacific time, we engage in in-depth conversations with some fascinating guests. And we hope by this to show a different form of politics, politics that really focuses on the issues and really delves deeply into them. It's gonna, a couple points of what you said is, it's funny you were, uh, I'm gonna equate uh, something we were listening to on the way here. I've been listening to uh, a tape on Vince McMahon from the WWE, and uh, I made some comments to Janice here on the way about how you know the idea of the heel and the face and I'm sorry but that's what politics is trying to do too and the sad thing is people like that they want somebody to be the heel which is the bad person they want somebody to be the face that's the good person they don't really want to look at both parties as equal going into it you decide this man's like thinks of this and that they really do like, people like looking at it as is the one's the good guy, one's the bad guy. And they like making that mental image. And I believe that's what the politics, politicians try to do. A lot of times they try to make the other person out to be the evil person. The other person, then they're the good person. And when you talked about the, the fact that we asked that question, uh, is your life better now? I think back to, I'm sorry, I'm gonna say the Reagan years. And the Reagan years to me, we're good, there were some good things, interest was low, everything was low. But in all reality, it was, you were robbing Peter to pay Paul. And although people were having a good time at that time, there were things that were going places they shouldn't be going. And after Reagan was there, out, that wasn't maintained anymore. And it wasn't the fault of Clinton coming in or anybody else coming in after Reagan. It was just the fact of the politics, they were robbing Peter to pay Paul your interest rates were, late, were low, but what was really happening there? And you know, you think, oh, my life was great, but is it gonna be great? You know, we talked about political things and working for the government, and uh, you find that stuff happens when you work for the government. You're still working for the government, so you can't make a comment. But uh, I used to see that a lot too, and you know, somebody leaves, and then things fall apart, but it really isn't the new people that made it fall apart. It was the fact that the policies they were doing really weren't working like they said they were. But temporarily, it looked good, but it isn't. And that's, that's the kind of thing that the Trump campaigns and his stuff remind me of. It might give people some other New Year's that they think are good, but are they really good or is it just smoke and mirrors and like that old saying, like I said again, Peter, robbing Peter to pay Paul. And it's that that's what I, I'm afraid of with politics, politics. They do that and people fall for it because again, they come back to people like the, the heels and the faces. They like having somebody they can feels the bad guy and somebody's the good guy. But I hate to say this as, as an adult, I realize sometimes adults are sometimes bigger kids than the kids as far as how they feel and react to things. And I think people a lot of times politically react that way. It's not really as rational a decision as it should be. And and like you say, I hope that's what the Transhumanist Party brings to it is more mm -hmm. rationalism and actually talking about the real issues, not you know making people uh, uh, think otherwise. Like my favorite campaign lady, I don't know if you have that commercial here, it was uh, somebody got uh, killed and like it was by somebody that came across the, the Mexican border. And they're like, oh, all these people are coming across the border. These people shouldn't be left in. They belong to a, a an organization. And that's why they did this crime in this country. If they hadn't been left in, they wouldn't have done it. But I looked at that though, actually the other way, if you looked at the statistics, mm -hmm. 
if you're talking about how many people are coming in and then these two people mm -hmm. out of all these people did something that you can point at really if you look at that statistically they're working against themselves because two people out of all those people they're talking about is not a high percentage but it gets people emotionally wound up and they feel angry about it and then you have the good person bad person again Oh yes, all of these PR spin masters that work for the major political parties, they know that a single anecdote that evokes strong emotions is more powerful than statistics or data. And indeed, humans have this bias toward really salient and sensational information that really is of an outlier nature. Think about how many people are afraid of terrorism versus how many people are afraid of dying in an automobile accident or dying from a heart attack, even though the latter are far more probable as causes of death. Right, exactly. So this is unfortunately a flaw in human psychology, one of the many cognitive biases that humans are subject to. And in the Transhumanist Party, we often deliberate about ways to overcome those cognitive biases. Now, I don't think our knowledge of the brain is sufficiently <laughs> advanced for us to actually go in and re-engineer the human brain without serious side effects. So I'm not suggesting that people go get Neuralink implants right now, though some people who are severely disabled can gain significant functionalities and have more of a semblance of a healthy life as a result of those implants. But for most of us, the technology is not there yet. So again, this gets us back to applied rationality and continuing to engage in a different manner of discourse, even if it's not seen as being as glamorous, even if it doesn't attract as many clicks or as many views. We still need to persevere and attract the kinds of people who are willing to engage in that thoughtful discourse. Of course, Trump, as you mentioned, is an opportunist. And if he sees a situation that he can spin to his advantage, he will do that. And really, the misery of the past few years was not predominantly caused by a human or any group of humans. It was caused by a virus. And that virus has had so many secondary and tertiary effects. It disrupted our supply chains. It led to shortages of goods. It led to a situation where in order for people to not lose their livelihoods, the governments had to provide additional financial support. And that did have an inflationary tendency associated with it as well. And of course, this virus is still with us. It's continuing to disrupt our lives, continuing to infect people, continuing to lead to severe health consequences. And what we really need is a concerted effort to defeat it. But unfortunately, with all of the finger pointing, with all of the polarization and the blame that gets thrown <laughs> around, instead of uniting to defeat this common enemy, just as we should unite to defeat other diseases that are our common enemy or death itself that is our common enemy, humans, as is unfortunately all too typical, have become arrayed against one another. And so how can we resolve that? How can we institute initiatives that actually lead people to recognize as humanity, we should all be on the same side. We should all be fighting these foes like viruses, like natural disasters, like the existential risks that can afflict our species. If a meteor uh, enters uh, our atmosphere, if it's of the size that destroyed the dinosaurs. It could lead to another extinction event. Or if we have another Carrington event due to a large solar flare. Or if we have a situation where, uh, for example, there is a nuclear war. Uh, that's a man-made existential risk that we need to work to prevent. And yet it seems contemporary politics has become so petty that it's all about just blaming the other side for short-term gain. So we need to consider the incentives involved as well. I think the American political system is uniquely vulnerable to this because we have plurality or winner-takes-all voting. We don't have any sort of proportional representation. In most states, people can vote for just one candidate. In the Transhumanist Party, we advocate and we use ranked choice voting in our own 
votes for platform planks or for candidates where people can rank order their options so that they don't have to vote for what they consider to be the lesser evil, they can reveal their entire preference set. And likewise, there are examples of parliamentary democracies where there's proportional representation. So for instance, our friends in Germany with the Party for Biomedical Rejuvenation Research are running in the EU parliament elections right now. And we had a salon with their chairman, Felix Wert, who is based in Berlin, just this past Sunday. And he was discussing how in order to get one seat in the EU parliament, a party only needs to get 0.5% of the vote in Germany. So it could be a minority party, but it still gets some representation. And as a result, it's possible for a much greater diversity of ideas to actually have influence politically. So in the United States, could we move to a proportional representation system? I think that would help to a great deal. But even having more inclusivity in debates, I have donated to an organization called the Free and Equal Elections Foundation. And John, of course, you and I attended the debate in March 2020 in Chicago. Yeah, that was a very nice. Mm -hmm. It was interesting to hear a lot of different views, like you're saying. There, there were a lot of different views and people representing a lot of different viewpoints and coming from different areas and stuff. And that was very nice to see. And it's a pity that something like that isn't telecast on major networks and stuff, that people could see that and just see the thoughts and ideas of the diverse people that actually are trying that aren't being noticed. Yes, absolutely. And Free and Equal is hosting other debates this election season as well. It has already hosted two, and I was in attendance in the audience at the debate in New York City on February 29th of this year. So that was a fascinating experience as well. But I think we need more of these kinds of debates, and I agree, we need more media exposure. The mainstream media will not necessarily cover these kinds of debates because unfortunately, a lot of the executives and even the journalists themselves have this notion that they would be helping a certain mainstream candidate win if they covered third parties, if they covered minor party candidates, but that's not really the case because as I tell people, my vote does not belong to either Trump or Biden. If I am not allowed to vote for the candidate of my choice, I'm not just going to go vote for one of the mainstream candidates. I might vote for none of the above, or I might stay home. And I think a lot of people are of that view, and they're being disenfranchised right now because many states have very stringent ballot access requirements. Many candidates are just not allowed to debate, or they're not covered by the media if they set up their own debates. So we need a system that is more inclusive, and we need more options. So independent media are extremely important. What you're doing with your channel, John, helps get the word out. And fortunately, there has been a growth in various video platforms online as well. So YouTube, while it's still a good option for content, is not the only option. And sometimes if YouTube uses its algorithmic censorship mm -hmm. in uh, certain strange ways that don't make any sense, other platforms might be able to host videos that aren't subject to those restrictions. And I trust individuals. I think the behaviors of the masses are often misguided and go in the wrong directions, but individuals are generally smart. And if individuals are allowed to think for themselves, to seek out their own content, and to essentially challenge prevailing ideas, then they'll generally arrive at a good place. They may not always be free of mistakes, but overall their outlooks will be sounder than if they just parroted whatever the mainstream talking points were. Well, the other thing I think that'd be good about people hearing other candidates and other points of views is maybe the main candidates would hear these other points of views and realize that some of the people out there are interested in some of the other points of views and maybe incorporate it into what they're doing uh, and make it a better platform for themselves by hearing it also. You know, maybe like we had an Indian representation. We have, I forget, what's the guy that puts the boot on his head? Oh, Vermin and Supreme. Vermin, I love that guy. Yes. 
but it's you know you know i love the green party too and they they, they make their comments and they make their issues and i think it would be better if the public knew their ideas and that if the other can the main candidates heard and realized that people did like some of those ideas it might make them incorporate and think a little broader themselves also even though it might not help get the other candidates in it might get the thoughts of other possibilities of how to do things out there so there's other ways that that could help also i think yes it has often been the role of third parties in american politics that they would bring certain ideas certain issues to the forefront of public attention and then one or both of the major parties would adopt those issues eventually because they saw that there is public support and candidates from the major parties then could use those issues to get themselves elected. Ultimately, mainstream politicians primarily care about what will get them elected. They are not thought leaders. They are followers. Politics is a lagging indicator of public opinion rather than a leading indicator. So is religion, by and, the way. And sometimes you said like about the short term. Sometimes mm -hmm. I feel they think in the short term, which to me is sort of what I also said about Peter paying Paul. Mm -hmm. They can make things in the short term look great, but are they really great? You know, and then they go back and say to people, well, was it better then? It appeared better, but appearing isn't, appearances aren't always what's really going on. You know, the smoke and mirror thing. Sometimes it's smoke and mirrors. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think a lot of politicians use that, it's a pity. So we were saying now about Tom Ross. Tom Ross, uh, trying to get him on uh, Louisiana and- Tennessee. Tennessee. And uh, now he's the presidential candidate. Now he has a vice presidential candidate. Is he trying to get on any also himself or just we're working on Tom? Well, in order to get on the ballot, one gets on the ballot as a ticket. So the presidential candidate and his running mate, our vice presidential candidate is Daniel Tweed. He's based in Thousand Oaks, California. He has run for city council there a number of times, four times, I believe. And each time he has gathered over a thousand votes. So he does have uh, some ability to essentially mobilize people in that area to care about a variety of local issues. He's very much into citizen activism and what he calls citizen and community science. He's our director of citizen and community science in the U.S. Transhumanist Party as well. So he is always looking for these voluntary grassroots solutions from the ground up where people can cooperate in a kind of decentralized libertarian ethos and make things happen that the central government or the local government might not always be able to do either because it's legally constrained or because the solutions from the top down would just be inefficient. But uh, he's always proposing some interesting ideas and these kinds of grassroots projects to work on. So he's a good complement to Tom. Tom often thinks of essentially these larger scale societal dynamics, essentially. How is AI going to transform our society and in some ways help bring out those aspects of our humanity which cannot be automated away. So Tom often thinks of these large-scale societal transformations and what can people do to respond to them, to adapt to them, not to react against them or stop them because I don't think that's possible and Tom doesn't think that's possible either, but to be the best humans that we can be in the wake of these well, changes. We, we hope that all of us can be that. Now, I said I wouldn't keep you too long today, uh, anything you'd want to say in closing closing, or anything you want to stress about where they could go to find out more about Tom or what they should do to uh, back Tom? What, yes. what might you have? So please go, first of all, to transhumanist-party.org. That is our official website. Go to Tom Ross's website, which is tomross.com slash 2024.html. Also, be on the lookout for our Virtual Enlightenment Salon streams. They're found on my YouTube channel, which is G. Stoliarov II. So the first letter of my first name followed by my last name followed by uh, two capital I's. That's the Roman numeral for the second. And subscribe to my channel. 
because you'll be able to participate in our live chats for the virtual enlightenment salons and get a lot of interesting ideas, get to interact with our speakers and with us. And furthermore, please reach out to campaign at tomross.com for how you can volunteer for the campaign, either in states where we're seeking ballot access or in other ways, because wherever you live, we could use people to promote our content online. We could use people to talk to others in physical spaces and lead them to become aware of transhumanism, of the US Transhumanist Party, of the Tom Ross campaign, of the fact that there's a way to do politics differently than the Republicans or the Democrats are doing it. Well, thank you for being with us again. And uh, I'm sure we'll talk again about this and other subjects. Uh, hopefully things will go good and we're, we'll get uh, Tom out there. And, uh, you know, it isn't just about hoping Tom wins, but it's about hoping the fact he's getting other additional thoughts out there and showing people that there's options. And that's important for people to know that there's options. It's not just the same Democrats and Republicans. There's other options out there. And that's great. Well, thanks for being with us and being with us actually live today. We actually interviewed you live, which is great. I'm glad we could do this. And uh, we will talk soon and interview you again soon. I'm going to try and uh, hook up some more interviews with Tom and, uh, and get to, to discuss things with him. So thank you. Thank you.